so I'm going to um, do my usual uh, thing and just do a little bit of an overview of the last 12 months. Um, I don't want to waste too much time because I want to get on to the other guys. There's some really interesting stuff to show you um, on some you know, live projects and seeing how the content's being used and the standards are being used. Um, but I'll jump right into it. So uh, there's been a fair bit of uh, development going on in, in different areas of the initiative. Um, for the la over the last 12 months, as you would have seen this morning with Warwick's presentation. Um, I want to sort of, I guess, focus on the area that we're involved in, which is obviously the technical and the Revit side. Um, and I just wanted to update a few things on the um, Revit template. Pause for technical difficulties. Speak like yourselves. It's all right, there's more people coming in anyway, so it's all good. All right. All good? You need to extend it back. So that's us. <laughs> Come and say hi. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, well, a lot of you hope you've all had a good lunch. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for coming to this session to see us today. Um, so yeah, my name is Adrian from uh, Irwin Consult, uh, a company of uh, WSP. So a little bit about uh, Irwin Consult. I guess we're a multi-discipline uh, engineering consultancy company. We also involve uh, in structural, service, structural as well, uh, civil, traffic, waste, uh, environmental sustainability. Um, and we've, uh, we've been in Melbourne for over 60 years now. Um, maybe a lot of you have probably heard recently we've been acquired by WSP as well. And we've had a long successful track record of um, you know, great projects. Uh, we've had you know, pharmaceutical, laboratory, high-rise offices, schools, all sorts of projects, exciting projects, and it's been a, it's been a great experience. Um, a bit about me, for why not? You know, I'm presenting. So, I, if, when I first left school for two and a half years, um, I did manufacturing drafting, uh, then decided to move into the building services industry uh, about 11 years ago. For the last, uh, in those 11 years, three years, uh, I've been the BIM coordinator at uh, Irwin, Cons Irwin Consult. And in the building services team over there in East Melbourne, we have about 23 modelers um, there at the moment. Um, okay, uh, so uh, so the the template was um, originally designed. Uh, so the Urban Consult decided about eight years ago. I think it was about eight years ago. It was seven or eight years ago to move across to uh, Revit. And our, our original template was pretty much in-house development. Well, it was, it was good. It was for the first time to be moving across to Revit. It was it done its purpose. Um, it was not really industry standard, so a lot of the families were custom made as well. So a lot of the families did take a lot of time to create, uh, a lot of t cost and cost of money. Um, the models uh, were uh, the contractor needed to start from scratch. Um, so once we developed the model, then it went across to the contract, started from scratch, which is not really necessary in today's day and age. We shouldn't be shouldn't be doing that, and. To me, uh, drawings didn't appear as great as they did in AutoCAD. I just felt like in 2D, they just weren't that great. Um, so, we said, so Irwin Consult decided to make a change. So, there's three main reasons why we, we made it, decided to make a change. Um, <coughs> specific, specific project requirement, um, internal requirements for change, and wanted to produce great documentation in 2D and 3D models. Um, so, Irwin Consult uh, worked on a 
CSL pharmaceutical project uh, called CSL Privigen. Um, uh, not sure how many years ago that was. Um, and then we moved on, we won another job, which was CSL Alberix. And so, the less, so we learned from our previous job that we needed to um, take that step forward and to produce great level of documentation in 3D models and so on. Um, so we, we, we took on the BIMAP OZ template. So a lot of lessons were learned from that previous project. Um, one of, the, one of the issues was we learned from Privilege and going to Alberix was we wanted to minimise the contractor remodelling the shop drawings, like I said before, because it's just a waste. It's, it's not necessary in today's day and age. Um, and we also want a great level of um, coordination and actual uh, spatial requirements um, to be precise. Um, so, sorry. So. Um, so the other, also the other reasons why we also want to move across to the BIMAP OZ template was also to have the consistency between all our, our uh, models, um, so they all look pretty much the same. And uh, sorry, yep. Um, here's a, so as you can see there on the left hand side was originally in house uh, template, then moving across to the BIMAP OZ template. Um, you can see they're much much more detailed, um, much more detailed. It looks like almost like a shop drawing there as you can see the pipes and the um, chillers and so on. Uh, with, with the BIMAP OZ template, it was very easy for us to integrate it into our workflow, Revit workflow. As you can see, the um, ductwork routing preferences were all there ready for, ready set up for you to go. And you can also see the pipework routing references was all pretty much set up there for you to go. Um, so you can see, for example, like carbon steel threaded and butt welded or even copper press fit was all set up there with all the bends and so on. And also there was even Victolic as well. There's, there's a few others you can see on the side, the scroll goes down. So it was all pretty much set up, ready to go. Um, there's also the online content, which we, we use quite a fair bit. Um, so there's manufacturer's content, which we, we tend to always visit as well uh, to download some of the content. Rather than recreating a family or so, and we always you know, visit the manufacturer's content or even sometimes the generic content, because uh, sometimes there's some updates there that we, we uh, move across into our models. Um, so yeah, so uh, the like, like I said before, um, it's a highly accurate quarter, uh, model. So we 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 had to allow for so in this scenario here, I'm trying to show I'm trying to show here. Sorry, is the the allowance for pot of valves as well. So a lot of models, I guess, will just show uh, a pipe coming off a unit and just basically turn and let it run wherever. But we we actually showed things like strainers, like you know, actual size of a strainer, the actual size of a valve. So the actual pipe run from the unit would be this long rather than this long. So it's, it's getting a high accuracy of um, coordination in the model. And this is just another example um, there of you know, using the content from the BMAP OZ template and also the content from the website with the valves and, and so on. Um, so this was CSL Alberix, uh, and you can see that's the Urban Consult model there on the left hand side. Um, so we actually modeled that into a 1 to 50 scale. And the right you can see AG Coombs model there. Um, so basically the model was just copied over to AG Coombs and AG Coombs just modified it from there to produce their manufacturing drawings. Um, and basically you probably saw that image this morning from Warwick's presentation. But uh, there's the finished product of the CSL Alberics. And it was great to be part of that, actually that project. Um, and yeah, so and now we've moved on to another CSL project called CSL Aurora, which has actually been handed across to AG Coombs. Um, and the team there have done a great job on that one as well. Thank you very much for that. Thanks. Hi all. Um, I'm Ben Pfeiffer um, from DCM Services. Um, my role in um, DCM is the um, drafting and BIM manager. Um, DCM is a South Australian based tier one design mechanical contractor um, with an office in Adelaide and Perth. Um, I'd like to thank uh, AGK for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, I've been coming to these events for the past eight years and the template and um, BIMF Oz initiative um, is something I feel quite strongly about and I don't believe the industry would be um, where it is now without it. So I'd like to commend Summit, Shannon, um, the AMCA and all the crew for making this event um, what it is today. Um, so. As a mechanical shop drafter, today I'll be speaking from a hands-on perspective. 
um, about the modelling and shop detailing coordination perspective of BIM and sharing some observations um, and lessons learned along my BIM journey. Um, so if you're a company that's considering entering the world of BIM or a company that has made the leap um, but isn't seeing the results or a bit frustrated with the progress so far, um, it should just give you a few insights and things to consider. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big advocate for the practical application of BIM um, within construction. Um, I feel the industry gets lost between the excitement of what we can see BIM doing in the future, but forgets um, in some cases there's still blokes on site with hard copy drawings and using tapes to set out from. Um, we need to get better at choosing the best technology from what's on offer and apply it to a realistic expectation um, of where the industry currently sits. So um, mechanical and BIM, um, I believe um, mechanical um, has initially suited the mechanical shop drafter, sorry, modelling has uh, suited the, the uh, mechanical shop drafter best, um, as they typically have the largest equipment um, and scope and um, dimensionally, and usually are the coordinating trade, um, as this is currently reflected with most mechanical sub-trades um, modelling their projects in one way or another. Um, the RFI process is something that benefits greatly from modelling a project, um, especially because of its visual aspect. Before modelling, um, you'd take some screenshots of plans and sections, mark them up, um, issue lengthy emails explaining the issue. Um, whereas um, with an isometric view or a federated model provided, any person can interpret or understand the RFI. And you're less likely to get an ambiguous response that may put the issue back on the trade to resolve. Um, you simply can't argue with screenshots, you know, showing ductory ceilings um, and things like that. Um, another reason BIM suits the mechanical trade um, is the simple fact duct is uh, prefabbed off site. Um, this puts further weight on the documentation and adds a step that is quite often forgotten. The fact that each piece of ductwork is made for the individual project. Um, and there is no shopping list at a Bunnos or a trade shop. Every piece is custom made as required. Um, this makes the modelling and coordination of duct very important and can be the difference between a project that runs well or is a real challenge on site. Um, another area that's brought the coordination and project documentation process ahead leaps and bounds um, is the cloud. Um, the fact now that live project models can be accessed anywhere, anytime, uh, is a huge step forward. Um, this overnight got rid of the dreaded uh, Akinex Friday model upload and uh, Monday model download. Um, and the drafters always feeling like they're behind the ball. Um, as when the model, new models were loaded, they find areas that they thought were complete, but only have to be changed by another trade. And this um, just uh, requires further, for, further coordination and general frustration between the trade modelers. Um, so the cloud environment has helped um, improve this scenario out of sight. Another big benefit uh, of the cloud that's quite often overlooked is the fact that multiple modelers um, can be authoring the one model at any one time and don't even have to be in the same office. Um, this opens up the opportunity to put many hours into a model over a short period of time um, to meet tight deadlines um, if the resources are available. Um, but the area that I believe is seen the greatest leverage from modelling um, is of course the project coordination um, through clash detection. Digital clash detection has completely changed the documentation process for a project. Um, before this, there were CAD overlays done and everyone would get around the table have a look. Um, but now with Navisworks, a large number of clashes can be picked up and resolved through the documentation process. Meaning trades can hit site with confidence. Um, the, the majority of the issues have been resolved. Um, an observation I've noticed as being the lead coordinator on projects um, is sometimes you feel like the bad news guy for the project. Um, every coordination meeting, every clash report, there's always something to resolve. And I'm sure when I walk into a coordination room, um, everyone's wondering what I have for them today. But BIM modelling has provided a way to resolve a great deal of the project's issues before getting to site. And over time, with running coordination meetings efficiently, 
The fellow sub trade teams are catching on that this hassle up front, that it unfortunately is sometimes seen as, does help with the site install, and all the effort put in up front is worth it, and everyone is more likely to meet timeframes and budget. It's essential the modelling teams for all trades understand what's expected of them um, and the processes and technology that is to be used. Um, this personally is something that I prioritise as part of the lead coordinated role on a project um, to, sure, to ensure all trades meet deadlines as a team together. Um, speaking openly about the industry, there are many hurdles um, with implementing BIM um, or Revit um, into a company and its processes. Um, once a company has decided to go down the path, um, there's this dive-in approach um, regarding the documentation and drafting um, of a project. The company will typically need one or two of their team to commit to the cause and tough it out for the one to two years of struggle um, to get Revit developed to a, company, to a point um, that they start to feel comfortable with. Fear of the unknown. Um, as the industry is typically very time poor, um, this leads to the safe or known path being taken, not allowing time for personnel to learn new programs, technologies or formats, formats um, and develop them for the company's benefit. Uh, staff turnover um, is another bad trait of the industry. Um, this is not only because the industry has seemed to be tough or hard, um, but the bigger issue is once someone has got themselves a high level of understanding uh, about BIM or the Revit process, um, you need to hang on to them um, as there is a vast shortage of supply and technical people with the refined skills in Revit or BIM. Um, they become quite valuable and may leave for another opportunity with another organisation. So the company effectively loses that expertise overnight, um, but not only loses that individual's expertise, but all the time, training, um, development that has been invested into that person. Um, lack of training, um, this has become a bit of less of an issue, um, but early on there was a lack of good courses um, for Revit or BIM, and, and the technical staff were pretty much learning uh, as they went. And there, there also is a general lack of understanding in the industry of what it actually takes to create or build um, a model and all the components required. Um, initially there was a crossover between CAD and Revit and there was more time um, and therefore more cost so the benefit wasn't always seen. Whereas now a project that is modelled, um, I can say with confidence that there is, will be less site issues um, and delays due to coordination than a project documented in CAD um, with the same timeframes and budget. But um, having said all that, the, um, looking forward for the industry, I believe um, we should all be very positive about where we're all going in regards to BIM. Um, I believe the real benefits are starting to be seen by a larger group in the industry. Um, I love it when I get asked from a builder or architect or client um, for a model. Um, it's great to know that these models that we spend so long creating um, are getting used. Um, and we're not just creating them for as-built. Um, technology is no longer a limiting factor. Um, initially, many workarounds were required to make the software act how we wanted. Um, and the common example was um, just, just make, them, make the drawings look like CAD, um, when now the tech is actually driving the new processes and documentation. Um, another is ease of um, access to information, most notably the cloud. Um, this has revolutionised the way Revit, has, Revit models collaborate. Um, and has sped up the drafting process, um, as I've previously touched on. Um, there's also many companies doing a level of BIM by default, um, or as part of their internal processes already. Uh, companies are seeing the benefits of BIM, and it's inherently being added to the company's processes organically, um, without the push from an industry mandate. Um, and we are starting to get a more realistic understanding of what BIM can do for the industry, um, which, which I think is fantastic. Um, so I've only really just scratched the surface um, with my whole journey of BIM um, and all the ways I feel it's aided the industry. But with all that said, there was still one big elephant in the room. Um, there was no control or standard within the Revit or drafting environments. Um, it was pretty much every modeler for themselves. 
And from a mech shop drafting perspective, um, before BIM or Revit modelling, each state, um, even each company, tended to have their own standards um, and best practice approach when it came to shop drafting. Um, the shop drafting trade has been disrupted a couple times um, previously, going from the drawing board to CAD, um, which was ahead of my time, but now CAD to uh, Revit. And each of these steps have required a large amount of training and downtime to master. And most notably, this last step is, I feel, one of the biggest. Um, this is why the many of us that got onto, the, got onto Revit early um, saw the benefit of a master, or a master template or standards for modelling having to be created, as Revit was such a beast. Um, there are so many paths a template could take. Um, as, and early on, everyone was making their own from out-of-the-box templates um, that came from Revit. And once this has begun, I feel that some direction was lost with Revit modelling in general. And we all became, as the saying says, silos. So what the BIM MEPOS template provides is a fantastic starting point and will give direction for what a template should contain and some formality on how templates and families are created. So um, in conclusion, um, if your company looking to get into Revit or BIM, um, make sure you give delegated people time to time to spend developing the new technologies and processes. Um, probably more than just one, as multiple people learning new programs uh, or technology together speeds up development incredibly. Um, also consult with um, all areas of your company when implementing BIM or modelling, um, for example. Um, I've seen project managers and site personnel um, see benefits that myself or other technical people mightn't have and it's aided how they procure or improve their own processes. Um, don't fear technology, um, it's always new. Um, and as long as people have time to invest in it, the benefits will be seen. And uh, as a mech guy or a coordinating trade, um, builders, get us on as early as you can. Um, the benefits or influence of trades that trades have on a project quickly diminishes um, the later they're brought onto a project. And this has been discussed at length in um, various presentations at these events. But most importantly, everyone, get on the BIM train. Um, you won't look back. And get a BIM EPOS subscription. It'll ensure your company's Revit template will be industry standard and give yourselves the best leap forward uh, on the BIM journey. So have a great event and um, feel free to tap me on the shoulder um, if you want to discuss anything I've talked to you about today. Um, thank you. I guess this model, uh, the Bue Richards maturity model for BIM development is almost um, maps my journey. Uh, I came from a uh, trade background in refrigeration, um, so working in mechanical services uh, for um, most of my working life. And I started, uh, when I came into the office off the tools, I started on very, uh, at the end of the drawing board, went into uh, AutoCAD and then uh, fortunately worked for a company that was uh, quick to innovate and we uh, took on the uh, whole uh, CAD duct, CAM duct uh, position. So we moved into, I guess, um, what it was, uh, the best we could get, the, the 3D AutoCAD solution. Um, from there we moved across to, uh, to uh, Revit adoption fairly early on um, and started looking into digital point layout at the same time got involved with the uh, BIM Map Oz initiative and because we were using that, uh, that software and, and putting that out to, the, uh, out to the shop. So we were interested in that development. And then from, uh, from there, I guess, once we got into Revit, then I was uh, able to sort of see that move into the whole fabrication content and getting manufacturable uh, content coming out of Revit. So that's been uh, my personal journey. Um, Last year I was fortunate enough to be able to get a position with uh, Hanson Youngkin, so I've moved from mechanical services into a role with a, with a builder, um, and um, it's not really so dark on the other side, I can assure you. Um, and that, that was a great opportunity for me, because I guess coming from a, a, like a, a, well, a, a trade and engineering background and then to move into away from mechanical services, but look at BIM in a bigger uh, a bigger scope, so uh, I'm the uh, VDC coordinator for South Australia, uh, for Hanson Youngkin. And this is a company that, ha across its now 101 year history, has really been uh, very innov innovative. Um, and that innovation is driven uh, right from the uh, chairman of the board, David Beslick, who is one of the, uh, uh, the two families that actually own Hanson Youngkin. Um, and that, that, 
drive for innovation and the adoption of BIM is very strong in the company and so that's really uh, helping us get that change uh, through our national BIM manager Paul Nunn who's with us today also. So the company's uh, 100 plus years old, five states, so up the eastern seaboard, Tasmania, South Australia, um, 5,000 plus projects delivered nationally, annual turnover five years of 1.2 billion, so uh, pretty good for a, a, a small, if you like, um, company or owned by, uh, privately owned by two families. As uh, a builder, I guess we don't really author much in the BIM world. Uh, our responsibility as a company on the virtual construction side is really to, to coordinate, to collaborate and to get other people's information into a, into a format that's uh, understandable and can be handed over to uh, the client at the end of the day. Obviously we do use the, uh, the models though, we do install in that for ourselves, the um, uh, site uh, establishment and also safety planning, um, but obviously that's sort of lost once we get to the end of the model journey. So this uh, data journey that we have to manage is, I guess, um, reasonably complex because you've got many players involved providing data, which is you're hoping to come together to a consolidated output at the end, which is understandable by all parties. So um, this, I think, is when we start thinking about this role or when I came into, into my current role is it's thinking just beyond the silo in which you work. It's trying to really get people to operate outside of uh, their own little silo and to think about the data and the information that they're putting into their models in terms of all of the other players in that, uh, in that whole VDC space. So we uh, use the models ourselves, obviously, for uh, 3D purposes, for uh, visualisation, but also for um, clash detection using any one of the multiple formats we can. Uh, also use it for 4D, for simulation. So in, in particularly in these uh, 3D and 4D, we're really looking at, at, the, at the graphical data, aren't we? But we are also trying to use the, the, the schedulable data in there to build search sets and those sort of things. So we are looking at data uh, across the board to, to get our use out of it. Um, and we also uh, use it for 5D for cost planning and so we're, again we're looking there to, to mine the models for data, the reliable data that we can, we can um, uh, understand and interpret and push across into programs like Costex so that we can actually get some, uh, some quantities out of it and some costs derived from that. So we also um, in the company, uh, back in 2009, there was a push to uh, digitise a lot of our processes and that's been done through a collaboration platform which is called Highway. So this is uh, our own internal um, development in which we're looking to extract and, and interact with uh, the whole BIM space in ways that it can be reported on back up through the company structure and also linked into uh, all of the other areas of the company including the accounts and all that sort of stuff and also providing um, safety control on the site. So there's a lot of our internal processes are built around the data uh, that is contained inside our BIM processes and so we're very interested in that data and I guess one of the problems that has been uh, a, an issue and Ben touched on this is that the Revit was such a, gave us probably what we wanted but what we didn't need in that it's such a flexible uh, uh, forum on which or platform which to operate. So we just start thinking about the, the different ways in which you can control visibility or appearances um, inside of a, a, uh, the Revit space. Also the ability to create your own content, to create your own uh, parameters. And, and so we get this, this free for all um, that is probably um, hasn't, has been probably what we would have asked for, but not necessarily what we wanted because we actually need um, our data and even our graphical data to be understandable and translatable to other people. So we need structured data rather than uh, what maybe we had developed on our own in our silos. And so one of the uh, big things I, I think that is happening is the adoption of the uh, ISO 19650, so the, the publication of that as a standard to sort of try to standardise some of these processes and also the information flow that we are seeing. And one of the great things out of that I think is the, uh, the, the, the requirement to have a, a CDE, a common data environment, um, which we can uh, then share our data across and I guess um, 
in terms of what we're using, we are, we are basing our, our processes on the uh, Autodesk Forge platform and all of the BIM 360 um, apps that are available on that. And we are also using that in our own ways to actually try to get access out of that into our highway system and also interested in seeing how we can get that to interact with uh, other areas like uh, Aconix to keep a uh, traditional um, flow of information happening. But going back to that one common data environment, and I guess that's where we're, we're all interested in, all excited about, is being able to share this information. So we've got the platform on which to share the information but the other thing, I guess, is the information that is being contained in our models and whether, when we share it, whether it's actually providing um, a fit-for-purpose use for those that are um, outside of our silo. And so I guess this is, this is where we're moving down in this progression towards this, uh, not just BIM, but into iBIM, the integrated and interoperable data um, that can be shared and, and used by other players. And I guess that's what we're interested in seeing is, uh, is a, some standardisation in this area so that it is interoperable, that from this free-for-all where we were creating our own parameters, creating our own data in the formats that we chose, that we're actually going to be able to use it in a, in a shared environment um, that will be able to be used by everyone. And so again, coming out of the ISO 19650 standards, I think there's this, um, uh, this important statements coming through there that there's, there needs to be a classification of objects. Um, that seems to be a bit of, bit of a fundamental, doesn't it? If we've got a classification system, at least we can identify what elements we've got in the job. So that's a great starting point. Um, as laid out in ISO 1206-2. Uh, and that then refers you on to a, uh, a, a national annex. So the use of a national annex to determine what it is, what the categorisation method is going to be. Um, and I guess that's probably because um, uh, that not all countries want to use the same, the same method. And so we've got the uniclass system, which is basically coming out of the UK and the Omniclass system, which is coming out of the US, and its uh, predecessors in master format and uni format. So we've got all these classification systems as well as others like COBE and that sort of things for other purposes. So again, there's, um, we've got standards out there, but we're not even being told which classification system to use. So this is uh, a bit of an issue, I guess, in terms of how we actually get data into our models and usable data, shareable data, in an organised uh, format. I guess the best we've come up to in Australia in terms of a national annex, because the, the, the UK standard actually has a national annex and they've nominated Uniclass, for example, so they're sort of leading the way in terms of creating the, these uh, standards. Um, but where we're at, I guess, in Australia, is, uh, to my knowledge, is we've got three states which have now um, either got work in progress or, or, and actually I think WA is also underway with their, their work back in South Australia, um, maybe lagging a little bit behind. It probably would be nice if we did have a national annex, though, wouldn't it, if we could actually all work together as a country um, and come up with um, one standard in terms of adoption of the standards that we need across um, in BIM across Australia, because obviously we are working in a, in a national space. Uh, so I guess one of the things that does come out of this is that there is actually a, a move towards um, IFC being the, um, being the base model for um, translation of graphical data and also the nomination of Uniclass 2015 as being the um, classification system. So there is some commonality coming out through these different state um, annexes. So that's, that's great to see and we can only encourage that and, and wait to see that, how that develops. Internally, we've developed our own minimum modelling requirements. I guess that was to, to fill a void and, and actually expand upon the requirements of, uh, of IC 19650, is to sort of state for our purposes what we require people contributing to our virtual design construct processes, what we want them to comply to. So this is trying to get everyone onto the, the same space so that we can do that. Um, this is a bit of a challenge to implement though because depending on the, on the contract model as to how much influence you can have on that process, how early the builder is actually engaged on that process, therefore how early they can start um, specifying what they want. I guess the ultimate thing is to have the client doing that but I guess that's a, an issue of the clients not necessarily having the information to know what they want to ask for at the start of the process. So we're trying to uh, address some of these issues through our own controls um, and this is principally through our minimum modelling requirements which uh, Paul Nunn has been working very hard on. 
what, what is great to see in terms of uh, BIM Map Oz is that they are already uh, ahead of the game. So they've already got the, um, the UniClass um, 2015 as a classification system built into the into the um, schema. So that's, that's great to see that and we can only encourage the, the adoption of that. And, and I think the, the, the initiative actually addresses a lot of these problems in terms of uh, interoperable data, doesn't it? Because if we are using the, the content provided, and uh, here we've got some examples of the industry foundation models, if we're using those models in our, in our modelling from design uh, through to construction, then in terms of anyone coming to that content, the, the information is going to be understandable. It's going to be organised and it's going to use the same cl classification systems. So when you start pulling schedules out, well, you're not going to get a whole, you know, 15 different manufacturer um, parameters come up in your, in your selection and you've got to go through and sort out which one it is that you want. We all know how difficult that can be, but obviously if we're using this content and that's coming right down through the design phase all the way, this is a, this is a great answer to that. This goes beyond, if you like, um, ISO 19650. It goes beyond our minimum modelling requirements. It's actually everyone using the same content and if that was across the whole industry, it'd make things very easy, wouldn't it, that we would be able to actually um, make good use of that. One thing that I'd really like to um, see happen, and I've had a couple of chats with, uh, with Shannon about this, um, is there's some great content that's um, in, the, uh, in the template that's these builder's works um, <laughs> I, I, uh, elements, uh, families. Um, and we all know that that's, you know, we call it builder's works, but the builder doesn't really do that. He's going to have to send that out to someone else. So um, that information is going to have to typically be translated back to the architect, and the architect's going to have to deal with that in his model um, and, and send it on to someone else. And I just think it'd be great if, if across the industry we could start getting some of, the, some of this content adopted across the industry. And what I've suggested to Shannon in, is this would be a great thing for BIM Oz to help the industry out, is actually provide these things that we could then actually ask people to use. If it was given to us free of charge, we'd be quite happy with that. And then we could actually not just go and pinch it, but we could actually um, be allowed to share it and get people starting to use this thing. So this is a really practical way, I think, of just getting some basic collaboration happening. It's definitely not, you know, blue ocean stuff, is it? It's just, it's, it's, but it's a pretty fundamental and simple way of actually getting some, uh, some uh, benefit out of this, uh, out of this initiative, not just within the um, services trades, but to be able to take that information and share it out. And one thing I think is really important, actually, on that is the, um, is the penetration families, because um, I think it's, is it uh, AS4072, um, which requires the documentation of, uh, of penetrations for fire maintenance purposes. Like if that was standardised, then everyone would know that when we put a penetration in a wall, we can, we can model it as being a fire rated penetration, we can tag it, then we could get standardisation. Just some little runs that we could get, I think, out of the initiative in terms of the broader sharing and collaboration things that, that I'd like to encourage, well, I'd like to encourage BIM Oz to keep going with the great work they've done and to keep the, expanding the, um, the, the content that's there but also maybe to, if we can get this adopted more widely across the uh, collaboration space in construction. Thanks very much. Run the clock back 12 months ago. We had a conversation in this room probably, I think, Brendan, about um, cable tray, Revit cable tray systems. And so we, we started to investigate it and I think it was Autodesk or somebody or maybe even Andy Robbins suggested, why don't you try, see how you can go with modeling Revit cable train uh, with the systems. And we engaged somebody, high, highly skilled Revit uh, resource, to, to um, create a scenario with um, the cable tray systems. And you can see this is a, just a, a brief example of what happens, what the, what the behavior of Revit systems is um, with cable tray. And so we had some conversations with Shannon and, and Warwick, et cetera, and, and just uh, on a follow-on from this was, right, OK, let's, um, let's see if we can build out a, a fabrication cable tray database. So um, Warwick touched on that this morning, and that's what, exactly what we've just done. So um, I think that's now available on the website, is it not? Yes, yeah, so man, uh, Brendan mentioned it earlier on. So that was just um, uh, how that was four, four goes at getting this, a scenario that was required um, using Revit systems. So, we built out this fabrication database, 
Um, th please, those people in the room that, that, you know, the alarm bell starting ringing because it says fabrication parts, just take the fabrica word fabrication away, all right? Let's forget the word fabrication. Let's just call them parts that we can model with. And they do what they say on the tin, all right? So don't panic. So we've built this database with technical data from uh, uh, the, the, the content, the manufacturer's content, loosely based around manufacturer's content. Um, that's been populated in um, the fabrication database, and the result is um, something like this. So this is um, fabrication parts, cable tray, so you can basket, you know, trunking or whatever, all modeled with fab parts. And it was very easy. I'm saying that because I did that, and I'm not an electrical guy. So not only that, but we, we've got the benefits now, of course, of being able to export from Revit with an MAJ file. Thank you very much, Autodesk, for, for facilitating this uh, functionality. Um, means we can open it in something like uh, SDMEP, go figure. And um, if we've got some costing tables in there, some price lists, we can actually do some costings from straight out of Revit. So we've got the ability to model accurately. We can schedule as well from Revit. Directly in Revit, we can schedule. We've got the uh, reporting functionality from the fabrication parts in Revit now. Um, so I've just touched on that this, this afternoon. Tomorrow morning, um, as I, uh, Brendan mentioned it, we've got a, an electrical workshop happening at eight o'clock. So Brendan's going to uh, dive a bit deeper into this, I hope, really, yeah, and um, give you a bit more in-depth information around this. So that's what I've just mentioned about some standard size and generic sizing. We've even got it coloring, so you've got the coloring systems uh, in Revit. Obviously, those carry through to the fabrication products as well. Um, some standard naming conventions can be scheduled and can be costed. So, sorry to all the mechanical people in the room. I'm full of some long mechanical faces. How, how many people, just out of interest, actually do use electrical cable tray in Revit? Just a quick show of hands. Well, there's, a, there's a reasonable number of you, and I'm sure you've had some challenges, or maybe you haven't had some challenges, you're really good at it, but anyway. It's, um, it's a real good uh, opportunity to, to get some runs on the board. Um, and I just wanted to sort of kind of put out up this, um, this final slide, sort of final slide. Um, this, this is about forums about standards, you know, the BIMEPOL standards. Do standards matter? I thought I'll just throw this. Whilst I was putting my slide presentation together at the beginning of the week, I just happened to have the TV on and Four Corners came on. And I don't know whether anybody saw it on Monday, but it's worth watching because it's about the building industry in Australia and standards or lack thereof. And I've got three examples on that slide, which are some shocking sort of uh, scenarios that can happen when standards aren't, you know, met or followed. Um, so. It's important, and you know, we, we're, we're all responsible in this industry. We have a responsibility. Wherever you are in the food chain, you have a responsibility to deliver something which is fit for purpose. So that's why I wanted to put that slide up there. Standards do matter. We should be following a standard, and I believe in the BIMEPOS standard. It's the best standard in the world. So. Tomorrow morning, this is just a bit of a plug for tomorrow morning. We've got, the, for the mechanical guys, big smile on your face, in stream A, we've, is Martin in the room? I can't see you if you Martin's in the room. Yeah, Martin's just throwing his hand in the air. Martin's uh, over from the States, Texas, I think is right, is it? Yeah, it's a big state in Texas. Um, so Martin's joining us uh, in stream A. We've also, again, once again this year, kind, Autodesk have kindly managed to or allowed Craig Farish to come on the line. So he'll be dialing in from the UK. It'll be something like 11 o'clock at night, I think his time. And, and it's going to be, uh, I think I'm right there, Martin, is saying it's a look forward. So it's a look forward at what Autodesk are uh, 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 um, intending to uh, you know, develop in the future. So come along to that and uh, see what you know, ask some questions if you want to. On the Stream B side, we've got Brendan and Shannon. 
who are going to go into a lot more detail regarding the uh, around the uh, the electrical side. I'll also touch on the avail and hopefully oh, Brendan's going to do some demonstration of um, RevTag. Um, just a cheeky um, plug there for um, our RevTag tool. I know a few of you are using it in the room and. Uh, we built this off the back of your feedback, so many thanks to all of you who've been kind enough to give us feedback on the, on the tool. We hope you uh, make a good use of it, and uh, for your information, version four is out, is touch wood, will be out hopefully by the end of this month, there or thereabouts. Um, the new features in version four, we have got, I've got a beta version running on the stand, which showing, showing us some of the new features coming up. So um, those, uh, those have been requested by you, so we're developing them for you. Um, speaking of questions, have, has anybody in the room got any questions, or are we doing all right for time? It's, it's, it's sort of break time now, but people desperate to go on. Yes? Pressure drops with ducting in Revit. So Revit design, Revit systems you're referring to? Um, that's probably a question for you, Brendan. Uh, no, hello, oh, I'm on. Just get my colleague across here. Um, so obviously Revit, obviously, oh, come this way into the light, yes. Thank you, Matt. Walk that way. Revit has obviously inbuilt uh, calculation tools and pressure, velocity. Um, so I guess in general, to answer your question, um, Revit has its own back end. Are you asking in terms of how the BIMIP Oz? Is there a functionality for it? There, there is a functionality for it, yes. The so simple answer is yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, there are, I, I, and someone may be able to answer more than myself, but I do understand that the API in that area, in recent versions of Revit, has been opened up further than what it was in the past. So I believe you can, um, it comes out of the box with calculation equations that you can switch between, um, but you can drill into that if you have the skill and the, obviously the resource to put calc your own calculations it, in there. For, it for might, be a, for it might be a good question if you yeah. come along tomorrow morning on, the, mon on the, the Friday morning MEC session. It might be a good question to ask the Autodesk team. Yeah, we've got obviously Autodesk yeah. rep reps in the room and, are, and with us, so come and, come and see us on the stand, come and have a chat. Yeah. Um, yeah. We can go into more detail for sure. And uh, if I can just sort of add to that, just quickly, in, through the component specifications we're developing, um, we're looking at the connector settings for each of those components, and so not just ductwork, yeah. um, you know, a fan or a pump or yeah. whatever. We're looking at mapping those connector settings to the right parameters, so those systems can be fully connected with all the equipment and plan in there um, to perform that analysis. So that's something we've been uh, doing in the latest version of the specs. I think Warwick mentioned that briefly earlier this morning. Is there any, any other questions, or do you desperately need to go on for a break? I do. Um, so I'd like to just, on behalf of HG, I'd like to thank our three guest presenters this year who have done a stellar job. And uh, once again, thank you to the BIMEPOS for inviting us along to present here. Thank you.